case there's anybody new this week, my name is Stephanie Moret. I'm the Director of Donor Relations at the Coastal Land Trust. Um, we are recording the lecture and we're live on Facebook today. Um, so yeah, keep your camera on if you want, but turn it off if you want, it's up to you. Van is gonna put some links in the chat here in just a second if he hasn't already. Um, definitely the most important one of those to check out is the donate link. Um, if you would like to support the Coastal Land Trust with a donation, um, we would love that, especially if you appreciate the Little Lunch Lectures. Um, we'll keep everyone on mute during the talk, but if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat as we go along, or uh, at the end, you can unmute and ask your question. If you do put it in the chat, I will read it out loud um, to our speaker at the end of the talk. So, um, Cool. Our speaker today is Ranger Jesse Anderson. Jesse is new to Carolina Beach State Park, but he's been a park ranger with North Carolina State Parks for nearly eight years, previously at Pilot Mountain. Um, before that, he worked for the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Jesse is a dedicated bird watcher and lifelong naturalist, and he's no stranger to the geology of limestone sinks and the amazing diversity that accompanies them. With that, on to our topic for today. What is a lime sink pond? Jesse, to you. Hi, everyone. Stephanie, I'll go ahead and start my presentation to share my screen. Sounds good. I'm sure everyone just said hi, but they're all on mute. Yep, that's OK. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. How's that look? It looks good. It's great. Perfect. All right. So I'll go ahead and get started. So um, again, my name is Jesse Anderson. I'm at Carolina Beach State Park, and we're going to talk a little bit about why lime sinks. So um, first, a little bit about Carolina Beach State Park. So a little bit about Carolina Beach State Park. We have a little over 700 acres, 731 acres. And Carolina Beach State Park, if you don't know, uh, we are in the coastal plain, hence the Coastal Land Trust. Uh, we have 11 different named habitat types here at Carolina Beach State Park. Um, and the coastal plain of North America in the east is a global biodiversity hotspot. It's one of the 36 global biodiversity hotspots. And of the state parks, uh, we are one of the smallest state parks, um, but we're also one of the most visited. Um, with in 2020, we had 1.5 million people in 2020. Um, and because of some of our different habitats and our location in the coastal plain, we have lots of different carnivorous plants. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about three of our limestone sinks, but first we're gonna talk a little bit about our global biodiversity here. So here in the park, we have 11 different types of habitats uh, and that ranges from coastal sandhill fringe, xeric sandhill, scrub coastal, wet savanna, wet pine flatwoods, wet coastal fringe, evergreen forest, small depression pocosin, small depression pond, vernal pools, brackish marsh, tidal saltwater levee, and um, a couple more that have been split since, uh, since they've been named. But we're mostly gonna focus on the small depression pocosin, small depression pond, vernal pool type habitats. And I couldn't possibly do a presentation without mentioning part of the biodiversity here being our uh, state listed Eastern coral snake. Uh, they are probably, Carolina Beach State Park is probably one of the best in the state to find the coral snake. They are venomous, so if you do find one, uh, let one of us know because we're very interested in them, but they are protected in the park, so best not to touch them. And it's a great place for the Technicolor 
painted bunting, which is also found here that nests here. We've got a couple more months until they show back up, but they are migratory. Um, there's usually one or two that sticks around in the Wilmington area during the winter, but they should be showing up here in about a month or two. So if you're not familiar with where we are, we are right in the midst of all this uh, sprawl. Who doesn't want to live at the beach? Um, we're right here near Wilmington, among the town of Carolina Beach and Curry Beach. And to look a little bit closer into our park here, you'll start to see these small little openings, these small little depressions. And this is a, a shot from Google Maps. So you can kind of see in the middle of the park here, we've got quite a few depression ponds. And these are all of these lime sink ponds. Three have some very distinct names, um, grass pond, cypress pond, lily pond. But you can kind of see there's one also down here to the south. And then also there's a tiny little area over here that the park owns where we have our fitness trail. And there's also a lime sink pond over there. But we're going to talk a little bit about coquina ponds and my favorite limestone. So all of this biodiversity in sand. Yes, but it rocks. So um, we've got our underlying bedrock here is actually limestone. I have a, a sample with me, my friend coquina. Uh, and the, the coquina that is found here was deposited. Uh, in the Pleistocene, which is pretty much the age of everything giant. You've got we had giant sloths, we had mastodons, there were uh, saber-toothed tigers, um, but they're not necessarily found in our, our limestone uh, or our coquina. The coquina is made of a, a conglomerate of shells and sand and um, all the marine biology that washes up on our shores today but it underwent a little bit of metamorphism, right, to, to create its, its hard structure. And yes, I'm gonna talk about geology, and yes, of course it's hard because our coquina is not made of marshmallows. Um, have, have to enjoy a little bit of puns, why not laugh a little bit while we're, uh, while we're at lunch here. So um, again, our coquina is a limestone, um, made of mostly calcium carbonate. Uh, so that's the, the, uh, all the fossiliferous material that is and is put together and makes up this coquina. Uh, it is made of shells and bivalves and snails and all sorts of stuff um, and other invertebrates too that were found here. So limestone by nature uh, is impacted by what's called chemical weathering. So if limestone is just sitting out in the open, uh, limestone or marble, which is the metamorphic version of limestone, it can start to dissolve in rainwater because rainwater is naturally slightly acidic. Um, so when you have a, a bedrock of limestone, uh, all of that rainwater has to go somewhere, right? And with sand on top, of all this uh, coquina, you have all that rainwater starting to infiltrate down into the, the bedrock. And any sort of crack or fissure in the bedrock will start to allow for that water to pass through. And as it passes through, it starts to make, uh, make a depression or starts to wash away some of that limestone and dissolve it. So again, rainwater is slightly acidic. Uh, if you're not familiar with how limestone sinks or limestone ponds are formed, um, you've got this underlayer of limestone that starts to eat away, and you can kind of see it in that bottom left corner there. Um, all that calcium carbonate starts to eat away and it creates a void, and then that void starts to sink down inside. Um, and if you are familiar with and appreciate national parks like I do, uh, something like Mammoth Cave. Um, caves are also typically made of limestone. 
um, but they typically have a, an overburden or an, a layer on top of them made of a much harder rock, right? So uh, something that's not resistant or that is resistant to chemical weathering. So when water passes through something like granite, it may just wash through and not eat at that granite like it would the limestone underneath. So here on the right, you've, you kind of see how a sinkhole might develop. Um, but if that overburden is something like a granite, it may just, uh, may just be very resistant and create a void underneath. So where can you find coquina? Um, coquina, just like I have here, um, can be found uh, throughout our coast. And actually one of the most relevant places to see it is right in the middle. You might recognize that picture in the middle uh, on the, the top right of the picture in the middle. You've got that nice pavilion and rocks. Um, that is actually Fort Fisher State Recreation Area. And just to the north of that pavilion um, where the historic site is and where the uh, state recreation area is, you've got a really nice outcropping of coquina. On the left-hand side of this, of your screen, you can see uh, that's actually snow's cut. There are a couple places where you can see coquina there. And if you've got kids at home and you go to the uh, North Carolina Aquarium at Fort Fisher, in their touch tank, they have actually coquina rocks uh, at the Coquina touch tank there. Um, so geology rocks, but geography is where it's at. So a um, little bit more about why our limestone ponds are so diverse, right? So these limestone ponds are a breeding ground for amphibians. Again, the coastal plain is a, a North Carolina and a global biodiversity hotspot with um, very unique plant diversity. And that plant diversity tends to be located in areas where you have transitions between habitats. Uh, and that's actually referred to as an ecotone. Um, so the transition between the, the wet, boggy limestone pond to the, the wet sandhills forest, um, or even the, the dry sandhills forest, that transition, that slope between the two habitats, even if it's two or three feet in elevation change, that biodiversity is, is uh, very important to North Carolina. So again, that ecotone is the transition zone between two different habitats. Um, and in our transition zones and ecotones here in North Carolina, we have very, very good and high biodiversity of carnivorous plants, which we have quite a few of here, um, and also a lot of grasses and sedges. Um, so one of, the, one of the most diverse places in the, um, in the state. So one of our ponds that's named is uh, Grass Pond. Uh, it's a vernal pool. Uh, it, it only holds water sometimes of the year. It'll dry up completely sometime of the year if we don't have much rain. Right now it is teeming with life. Um, there's uh, tons of activity right now. And a lot of people might think, hey, we're in the winter. Um, why, is there, you know, why is there activity? Well, amphibians, especially frogs and toads and salamanders um, will actually take advantage of the lack of predators, lack of fish, and these nice warm, wet evenings uh, like we had last night. It was a nice warm evening and um, little grass frogs were deafening in the uh, in the grass pond area. Um, and no rush, but we have lots of sedges in the grass pond. Um, so our sedge, um, this is the coastal beak sedge. It's a um, species of concern in the state, um, significantly rare and uh, Last night, we also had southern leopard frog calling in grass pond as well. And if you're out anywhere in an area where you have standing water, you probably also might hear them. So if you've been to Carolina Beach State Park, again, we have um, diversity of amphibians and reptiles, uh, 43 different reptile species here, 
and 18 different amphibians. Um, one of them uh, we haven't seen in quite some time though is the Carolina gopher frog, um, which is down there on the bottom right. But um, so grass pond again is a vernal pool, so it only holds water um, some time of the year. It, it tends to stay fairly moist, but um, but doesn't always, it's not always completely full like it is right now. Um, so along the bottom here, we've got the green tree frog. We've got the Eastern narrow mouth toad, which is a really cute small little toad that sounds like a sheep. Um, and uh, the Eastern spade foot uh, toad, which is also um, the, the spade foot is an explosive breeder. Um, they'll breed in the middle of December or January. If we get a really high uh, or really heavy rainstorm, um, you'll see spadefoot toads all over the roads, um, and they often respond to vibrations from really heavy rain and um, will come out and breed in something as small as a puddle. Um, but they're, they're really active and really neat uh, as well. Spadefoots are probably one of my favorite. Uh, they've got these vertical pupils. Um, unlike many other um, types of frogs compared to our green tree frog that has a, a, or a horizontal pupil. So they've got the vertical. Quite the diversity in dragonflies. There's 36 different species of dragonflies throughout the park, um, some of which are migratory. So on the left here, we've got our wandering glider and also the, the um, common green darner. Uh, and then in the middle here, we've got a comet darner, which is a really big but colorful dragonfly. On the right, we've got an eastern pond hawk, and uh, this is the uh, painted skimmer here. Lots of dragonfly diversity, and of course, dragonflies take advantage of these lime sink ponds to breed because there's not many predators, um, and they provide food for other animals, but also uh, consume quite a bit of mosquitoes and other insects. Another one of our lime sink ponds that's fairly uh, recognizable here is our aptly named cypress pond. Um, the cypress pond is full of kind of a dwarf pond cypress, um, and pond cypress is different than your typical bald cypress, and I'll, I'll show you the difference here shortly, but uh, they will dry out a little bit. Um, but this pond, it tends to be full of sundews and bladderworts, uh, both of which are really pretty carnivorous plants. So here you've got the difference between pond cypress and bald cypress. Uh, pond cypress has these needles or um, leaves that stay very close to their, um, to their stem, um, where pond cypress or bald cypress on the right here is, uh, is deciduous, it'll lose its uh, leaves, and they're much flatter. It looks more like a, like a hemlock, almost. You take them from the mountains. Um, a couple other species that are found in, in our cypress pond, uh, tall barren milkwort and uh, tea tea. Um, both of these are really good for pollinators. Um, and we've got uh, quite a few, like I said, lots of sundews in cypress pond of both species. The one on the left over here is Drosa cap capillaris, which is our uh, pink sundew. And then on the right here, uh, we have uh, Drosa intermedia, which is our spoon leaf sundew. Uh, the final most recognizable pond, which is also the biggest and tends to stay wet most times of the year, is our lily pond. Uh, it, during the summer, it's got full coverage of this beautiful, um, our, our American water lily. And this actually used to be referred to as trash pond. So people that used to come and visit Carolina Beach and come to the beach used to actually uh, dump uh, glass and things like that outside of the pond. Um, but absolutely gorgeous pond that you know, we have a, a trail that moves right up to it. And all of these are different levels of, of lime sinks, right? So uh, much larger lime sink here that holds much more water uh, being low pond. As you can see, there's a lot of difference depending on the season. Um, during the summer, it's, it's lush and green. 
right now there's not too many lilies floating around there, but it provides all sorts of habitat uh, for things like our barking tree frog or green heron fishing, or during the winter, we have quite a few mallards that hang out there. Um, so all sorts of different uh, animals take advantage of these lime sink ponds. So even more so uh, because it's a, a, a more permanent body of water, the lily pond uh, will have even more amphibian diversity or different amphibian diversity than the other two. Um, on the top right, you've got a, a bullfrog tadpole and you can even find turtles uh, in there. So that's a chicken turtle down the bottom right. So why not enjoy your lunch by exploring some, some frog calls? And this was taken just a few days ago. Um, and this is actually something that if you were walking around the park at dusk, you could start to hear and I'm gonna play some sounds for you. So you can hear the overwhelming cricket-like chirp of the little grass frog. And then you'll also hear in the background a what sounds like a you rubbing your hand on a balloon, which is our southern leopard frog. Hey Jesse, we can't hear them. Did you happen to click the buttons? Um, if you want to go like stop sharing really quickly and reshare with the yep. um, sound, that'll that'll work. Awesome. Because we don't want to miss this. Yeah, that's true. Here we go. Yep. So again, the over overwhelming number of cricket-like sounds, and then those southern leopard frogs in the background. And again, depending on the time of year, we may have many different amphibians calling. So a couple different concerns for um, our park. Um, we've got lots of change with uh, differences in water levels and, and rainfall events. Uh, rise in sea level could potentially cause some, uh, some of our plants to, um, to be lost or impacted population-wise because of their salt tolerance. And of course, with one and a half million visitors in 2020, that's about 2,100 people um, per acre, if you look at the 731 acres that we have. Um, so that's a lot of people. So, um, you know, we're, we're always advocating for, you know, for leaving no trace and um, staying on trails and things like that. Um, and of course, uh, helping out in any way that you can. So now for the million dollar question, uh, my coworker came up with the name about why or do limes sink? And of course, limes do sink, but why they sink is another question. So any questions? Thank you for joining me for your lunch. Thank you, Jesse. That was very cool. I, I've been sitting here this whole time thinking, like, I don't really feel like I've seen all of that. So I either need to pick different trails or now I will know what I am seeing when I'm at Carolina Beach State Park. So thank you very much. Um, I do believe we have some questions in the chat. So I'll start with these. And then if anybody else wants to unmute and ask, you certainly may. Um, I think you mentioned this right at the end, but remind us when is the good time to hear the frogs at the park? So it depends on the species you're looking for. Um, so as far as diversity goes, um, right now you've got um, little grass frogs, southern leopard frogs, there are some spring peepers, you may hear pickerel frogs calling, um, and that's just right now. In another month or so, um, you'll start to hear some of the other species um, like 
say barking tree frog, squirrel tree frog, um, green tree frog, things like that. Um, if you're looking for the most bang for your buck, a, a warm, uh, right after, I guess a calm night on a calm warm night after a warm spring rain um, would be, would be the, uh, the, way to, the way to do it, so. And those dusk hours are, are when they are most active? Yes, dusk and, you know, throughout the evening if it's, if it's warm and uh, advantageous. So camping might be an option as well. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, oh, there was a comment from Jerry Reynolds. He said he caught gopher frogs in snake traps during research um, at the park in 78 to 79. Um, and that might have been the last time they were documented at the park. That is... From what I've seen, that is true, and um, Jerry will be in touch. <laughs> <laughs> um, there have been a couple of comments about your puns, and the jury is out. Half of them love them, and half of them are like, they're terrible, <laughs> um, with smiley, winky faces. So. Right, yeah. <laughs> Expected, yeah. So. <laughs> couple, a comment on Facebook, too. Um, and there's a question um, about, do wood ducks nest in the lily pond? Um, I don't think so. I don't think I've seen them there. No, it's, um, I think it's, it's probably not dense enough for wood ducks. I think along the, the coastal plain, they prefer kind of like a more like dense cypress, swampy, almost river-like habitat. Um, so not, not quite dense enough for, for wood ducks. Um, I've seen them around, but not seen them nesting there. Okay. Is there a duck that um, that might have been spotted at the lily pond that we might have confused with a wood duck? Um, I mean, it's very well likely that you saw wood ducks there. Um, so that, that could be, yeah. Okay, just maybe um, that they don't nest there. I haven't oh. seen them nesting there, no. Okay. Um, there's a question about, um, like, what's the difference between a Carolina Bay in a lime sink pond um, be, uh, because like don't Carolina Bays also have a high degree of biodiversity. Um, just right so um, the main difference there um, it's still a very acidic habitat um, but there's a lot of a lot of difference or a, a lot of variation in Carolina Bays and I think the you know the a lot of it has to do with size. So, you know, lime sink pond tends to be more of like a small Pocosin or a, a small depression pond. Um, whereas a uh, Carolina Bay, um, they, I think the, the, the basis or behind their geology is not entirely known. Uh, some of them, I've heard uh, theories of potentially, you know, being uh, created by, um, you know, large fires with, you know, the, the removal of a whole, um, you know, whole couple layers of, of duff or organic material creating that, that void. Um, there's a lot of different theories behind the creation of Carolina Bays, um, whereas lime sink ponds are, you know, very obviously made because of the dissolution of limestone underneath the soil. But yes, both, both very much linked to high levels of biodiversity because you, you still have those ecotones uh, between the, the pond or the Carolina Bay into a, a different coastal habitat. Gotcha. Good question then. Okay. <laughs> um, is the, is like, is limestone throughout this whole area and is that, would you guess, what is causing lots of the um, other sinkholes that might be happening in this area? Um, you weren't here at the time, but like right after uh, Florence, lots and lots of um, roadways had lot of sinkholes. Um, just curious if limestone is like the ground, the bedrock through this whole area. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, along all of the coastal plain, there is a lot of limestone, but there's also a lot of um, like mudstone too. Um, so a lot of it was 
inner lane depending on where you where you are and how much um, you know sea level rise and fall has has caused that deposition here along the, the coast. We do have a lot of, you know predominantly limestone, um, but from different depositional events. Um, so the stuff that's eroding here, the coquinas, you know, from the Pleistocene. Um, I've read uh, some some of the limestone, like the Castle Hain limestone, uh, is a little bit older. Um, so you know that that older limestone may have a different rate of dissolution. Um, it really all depends. Um, as far as a, a large flooding event like uh, Florence, it's very well likely that um, it would at least expedite that that process. Um, I would bet that some of those areas were already starting to see some voids underneath them before you had those sinkholes develop. Um, I can't necessarily speak directly to them, um, but that would that would probably you know, be how I would, I would say they would form. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat, but if anyone else has a question, you certainly may unmute and ask Jesse. Um, sometimes that takes a second to do. Um, I have a, oh, Gad, hey, go Jerry. <laughs> well, I, I just want to say, uh, Jesse, I was very kind to you and I kept my, my camera <laughs> off during your presentation so you wouldn't see me grimace at all those horrible puns. <laughs> But anyway, uh, well, that was I figured you would speak up if <laughs> I didn't realize you would be on, but I figured you would speak up when I saw it. So, uh, oh, so, wow. yeah, 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 don't take them for granted. So, yeah, 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 yeah. those are really bad. So, and I, and I appreciate <laughs> bad ones, obviously. Uh, yeah, I, I did research, you know, there in uh, 1978, 79, uh, trapping snakes, live traps, and uh, I did catch some gopher frogs, and they were. Um, they were young ones, so I think they were uh, coming out of the, the ponds there. My study area is very close to the Cypress Pond. Uh, and, you know, the, the park hasn't changed since those days. You know, the habitat is the same and everything. Sure. So I guess the only theory about why they're not there anymore, perhaps we had some very prolonged droughts, and perhaps the population might have been small to begin with, and maybe it just blinked out. Uh, you know, with prolonged droughts. But anyway, I, I keep hoping that they will show up. Uh, but anyway, that, yeah, that was a great presentation. I don't have any other specific questions really, but <laughs> great to hear it. Um, I'm looking for other people coming off me. Uh, I was curious, so I'm, I, I'm a big fan of the Reader Garden, the Reader Carnivorous Plant Garden up here in Wilmington and um, there is a sundew called the filiformis that grows there. And I'm wondering if you have seen that at Carolina Beach State Park as well. I'm not I, sure, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that one. Um, there are, I do know that Stanley, the Stanley Reader Garden does have some populations of carnivorous plants that are not typically found in North Carolina. I know that they have Saracena uh, leucophila, which is a, um, the white-lipped or the, the white pitcher plant. Uh, and that's found further south in places like Florida, Alabama. Um, they do grow here. They will grow here, but not necessarily. They, they weren't necessarily found here um, originally. Gotcha. Uh, so maybe so the filiformis is one of those as well, the sundew. Potentially. Uh, I'm, not, um, I'm not certain about that one. Okay. Just curious. Yeah. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thanks, Jesse, for um, for being here and, and um, sharing your time and your um, interest in geology with us. Um, I do invite everybody to come back next week. We have like a little uh, mini mini series, a little state park series. So next week, um, Ranger Emily Bunyer will be here from Merchants Mill Pond State Park. Um, that is a state park in the northeastern part of the state. I'm blanking on what county it's in. Um, Gates County, I believe. It, okay, cool, thank you. Um, so join us next week for part two of uh, State Park 
series. And then on March 12th, Captain C.R. Robbins will be with us to talk about the three sisters, um, the very, very old cypress trees um, that are found um, in the Black River. They, I mean, you've probably read the news, so I'm not going to give it away if I tell you that they are the oldest living trees um, east of the Mississippi, and it's very cool to see, and um, you'll want to come ready to hear some stories um, from Captain CR. Uh, we do have a full lineup uh, all the way into April for Little Lunch Lectures, so if you want to go to coastallandtrust.org slash events, you can see a full lineup of those. And of course, if you want to check out some lectures, maybe you missed one, um, they're on the lectures page. Van will put it in the chat. Um, you can find recordings of almost every single Little Lunch Lecture that we've had since last April. So um, definitely check that out and feel free to share them with your friends if there's something you think someone will enjoy. So again, thank you for being here today. Hope to see you again soon. Thanks, Jesse, and everybody have a great weekend. Bye. Bye guys.